Hello, welcome back. This is our last mini lesson for chapter 12. So the last piece um, of our navigation figure is the information processing. So what happens at the postsynaptic cell once that synaptic activity happens, the action potential comes in, we release the neurotransmitter, it crosses the cleft, it binds to the receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. What then? So that's what we're going to be talking about. Just a couple different ways that that information is processed or information is um, figured out what to do on that postsynaptic cell. So the first thing we're going to talk about are what we call EPSPs and IPSPs, which stands for excitatory postsynaptic potentials. That's the EPSP. And IPSPs are inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. So let's take a look at um, kind of a graphical representation of these. And you, you might see that they look just like our graphs of graded potentials. And that's exactly what they are. But we are seeing them in a different context. So before, the graded potential is what kind of triggered the action potential at our presynaptic neuron. But now at the postsynaptic membrane, we're taking that information coming in, and it is either going to depolarize the cell, which means it's going to be making it closer to threshold, potentially making it easier for that postsynaptic cell to trigger an action potential. If we do an IPSP, which is hyperpolarizing, we're taking the transmembrane potential further away from threshold, which is going to make it harder for the cell to reach threshold at that initial segment of the axon. So you can think of these graded potentials, the depolarizing or the hyperpolarizing graded potentials, as just facilitating maybe an action potential or making it harder, inhibiting a potential action potential from happening. So let's say we're hanging out at rest. So I'll get the highlighter um, function going on here. So we're hanging out at rest, and then we get a, a stimulus for a graded potential. This is the arrival of a neurotransmitter. So here is our stimulus is applied. In this case, it's excitatory. So maybe it's a acetylcholine or it's a neurotransmitter that opens sodium channels, allowing sodium to rush in. We know that when sodium enters a cell, we're gaining positive charges, and so we go up. But it's a chemically triggered stimulus. So it is the chemically gated channels found on that postsynaptic membrane because it's cell body and dendrites. So when it'll just kind of hang out in that local area, it's not going to do an action potential pattern like we saw in the action potential video. When the stimulus is removed, sodium potassium pump gets us back to resting potential. It, it's basically a graded potential, but if it's a graded potential on that postsynaptic cell, um, that's a depolarizing graded potential, we call that an EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential, because we're getting it closer to threshold. Okay, so threshold was negative 60 millivolts. The closer we get to threshold, the easier it is, the more likely that cell is going to fire an action potential. All right, let's cruise along and let's say then in the next stimulus is showing up, maybe a different neuron is communicating to this um, postsynaptic cell, that this time the neurotransmitter is causing the opening of potassium channels. So the potassium channels uh, let potassium out, so we're losing positive charges. So we repolarize, or sorry, hyperpolarize. So we hyperpolarize until the stimulus is removed, sodium potassium pump take us back to resting potential. Okay? But, and if we take a look, if this is a threshold up here, we are now further away from getting to that point. As opposed to an EPSP, we are now closer to that point. So that's all we're doing. We are comparing these stimuli that show up, these signals that show up on the postsynaptic cell, how close are we getting to threshold? If we're making it really close or closer, that's an EPSP. If we're making it further away, changing that transmembrane potential, um, then we are inhibiting it. So that's where the EPSP, IPSP naming comes from. If at uh, a third time, we get um, both of them happening at the same time, so an EPSP and an IPSP, take a look at what's happening to the um, resting potential. 
It just stays because they cancel each other out. So if we have an EPSP of you know, 5 millivolts and at the same time we have an IPSP of 5 millivolts and we start at negative 70, one's gonna to wanna to depolarize to negative 65, one's gonna to wanna to hyperpolarize to negative 75, they cancel each other out and the resting potential just stays and we're neither closer nor further away um, from threshold. So it's kind of a wash, all right? So those are your postsynaptic potentials. So you might be thinking, well, why, why do we have a, an IPSP in the first place? Why don't we want to excite every time we want to send an action potential? Well, not always. So let's do uh, an example here. So I'm going to draw a neuron, and it is going to be innervating a muscle. Let's say this is the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is your muscle that helps you breathe. When you inhale, the muscle contracts and it kind of goes flat. When you exhale, it relaxes and kind of goes dome-shaped. So you have a contraction and a relaxation. We have to have this cyclical pattern because that's how we breathe. So let's say we had a neuron. Oops, I wanted to do a different color. Let's do blue. So let's say how we have a neuron that's coming here and it is going to be excitatory, right? So it is, I should use a, the same color scheme, right? So they have red or I'll use orange. We'll do red. Okay, so here's a neuron, and I'll say it's excitatory. So it's going to stimulate this black motor neuron to fire. So whenever this neuron sends its action potential, you're going to get contraction. But if we only had a signal for contraction, our diaphragm would contract and we'd never breathe. We'd just stay contracted. So we have to alternate with an inhibitory cell, a cell that sends inhibitory signals. So we will stimulate with our excitatory, the EPSPs for a few seconds, that's our inhalation. But then we have to turn that off. So then we're gonna get the IPSPs coming in maybe at a higher rate, which will override any of the EPSPs. And so then the IPSPs come in and tell the muscle fiber or the motor neuron to not fire. And then our diaphragm is allowed to relax. So we have this ability for neurons to be listening to other neurons to say, okay, I need to fire and send action potentials now, um, but there might be other times where I need to turn off that action potential and I don't want to send any signals to my effector. So the, the motor neurons controlling your diaphragm, your breathing muscle, are a good example of why you'd want to send both excitatory and inhibitory signals to a single destination. All right, so those are EPSPs and IPSPs. Um, the next thing to take a look at is what's called summation. So, so far we've been talking about just like one arrival of a stimulus. Well, in reality, your brains and your spinal cords and your systems are so complex, it's more than just one um, signal showing up. So let's say we have signals showing up one right after the other, but each one by themselves isn't enough to trigger an action potential. So here we have our first stimulus, this guy right here, it's our graded potential because it's coming in on the chemically gated channels of the cell body. And here's our initial segment where we would be able to do our first action potential. Well, that first stimulus all by itself, maybe it only depolarized from negative 70 to negative 65, okay? It was a depolarizing EPSP, but by itself, it wasn't enough. But let's say another fired right afterwards, like right away before the effects of the um, first one went away and combined together, that added effect of the two graded potentials was enough to reach um, threshold. And so then we get an action potential. It's the same spot, almost like a double click on your mouse. So like one click is not going to make the action happen, but two clicks back to back will make the action happen. So that's temporal summation. Okay. The next is called spatial summation. So it's two signals happening at the same time, but two different locations. So one all by itself would not be able to reach threshold, but both of them together at the same time, but at different synapses, would lead to action potential propagation. So depending on where these neurons are getting when they're sending their signal, if one just fires all by itself, 
that postsynaptic cell is not going to create an action potential. Maybe you have to have two things happening at the same time to be able to fire this neuron. And that's how it's wired and that's how it's supposed to be because one isn't enough. I have another diagram to kind of illustrate this. So here we have um, excitatory um, presynaptic cell, um, the light green, the EX1. So if you had EX1 happening by itself, we can see that it does not reach threshold. And they're saying threshold is negative 50, but we'll just put in negative 60 because that works with what our book says. So excitatory presynaptic or the synapse with excitatory presynaptic neuron number one all by itself doesn't do anything. And then a little time goes by and another one comes in and it doesn't do anything. But what if they both fire um, one right after each other? That was our temporal summation, right? So here is our first one, and then here's our second one, and that gets us to our threshold, and so we get action potential. So this is our temporal summation. It's the same synapse, but one that's a double click analogy that I said back to back, and then you got your action potential. The next one is what if we had two different synapses? So this is our spatial summation. So excitatory input one, excitatory input two, each by themselves is not enough to reach threshold, but you have them coming in at the same time. So this is gonna create a greater potential. This is gonna create a greater potential and together enough to change the initial segment of the axon and thus you get action potential. So then here's a combination of that EPSP IPSP cancellation. So what if we get um, excitatory stimulus one, and then we get inhibitory, the EPSP coming in, we're gonna cancel this out and nothing is gonna happen. No action potential, because if they're happening at the same time, the depolarizing will cancel out the hyperpolarizing, right? So that is our information processing. We have EPSPs and IPSPs, and then we can see how they come in and sum at that postsynaptic cell. Now, here we're seeing three, which can add some complexity to it, but we have some neurons in our cerebellum, which is our little brain back here, by, um, back by our occipital bone. Um, it has upwards of 200,000 synapses on its cell body and dendrites. So imagine 200,000 synapses all over the cell body and dendrite. And it has to listen to all of that information coming in. Some might be EPSPs, some might be IPSPs. Some might be coming at spatial summation, some might be coming at temporal summation. But what's the point? I mean, what's the goal? It is all about bringing that initial segment to threshold. If you get 200,000 signals coming in they and they cancel each other out, that cell is not gonna fire. If, they're, if the majority of them are excitatory, then yes, we've checked the box, we've met threshold, we're gonna go ahead and fire. So that's all it, it's kind of weird to think about. Your neural processing is all about bringing the initial segment to threshold. Kind of takes the magic away of you know, thought and thinking and all that kind of stuff that happens in your brain. Okay, <clears throat> the last two things are kind of taking what we just talked about in our understanding of the synapse and how pre and post synaptic cells work and throwing another neuron in there. So let's say we have our yellow neuron here. See, I cannot figure out my highlighter. There we go. So we got the yellow neuron here that we are pre synaptic cell. And then we have the purple neuron here. Okay, that's our post synaptic cell. So in regular action, the action potential would come in, the calcium would um, enter the cell, we would release the neurotransmitter and we'd bind and then we get action on our postsynaptic cell. But in this case, we have the green cell coming in and it is going to release its own neurotransmitter on receptors that are hanging out on the synaptic knob of that presynaptic cell. This particular case, it's called GABA, G-A-B-A, -A, is released from this third kind of interloper here that's coming in and regulating what the presynaptic cell can do. GABA blocks those calcium channels. So when the action potential does show up, if GABA is already there, less calcium comes in, less neurotransmitters released, a, a 
smaller graded potential on that purple postsynaptic membrane. So it would be something like, okay, here is our normal neural path, but then we have this guy coming over here and regulating what happens. So this guy regulates what happens here, okay? So we are regulating that presynaptic neuron. In this case, it's presynaptic inhibition because we are reducing the amount of neurotransmitter that is being released from this yellow presynaptic cell. Well, if we had another third-party neuron coming in, um, and instead of blocking the calcium release, this one, in this case serotonin, keeps those channels open and keeps them open longer. So more calcium comes into that presynaptic cell, which means more neurotransmitter gets dumped into the synapse, which means a stronger and longer graded potential on our purple postsynaptic cell, which might facilitate um, bringing a threshold, bringing that uh, initial segment to threshold. Okay? So again, it's just another layer of complexity of how our neurons are organized to regulate what's happening at this kind of magic zone right here, the synapse. If we release a neurotransmitter, binds to the receptor, it triggers a graded potential. How big of graded potential, an excitatory graded potential, an inhibitory graded potential, it is all determined by the um, type of neurotransmitter and the uh, type of receptor that it's communicating to and the quantity of that neurotransmitter can all affect what's going to happen on this postsynaptic cell. All right. That's it. We finished 231 content. We finished chapter 12. Um, send questions, office hours, emails, see me in lab. Um, hopefully you enjoyed all of our material for 231. I'm looking forward to our winter break um, and also looking forward to coming back and doing 232 with you guys. All right. I will see you later. Bye.